We want and need know-how to deal with a fallen world population and a world under the power of the devil. School has tremendous potential. If we can go to a school and learn new things and new skills and be changed in our attitude and our perspective, school is a wonderful potential. But we live in very, very perilous times. Um, do you remember, as I do very clearly, watching television at the moment uh, at, on 9-11 when the World Trade Center Twin Towers were hit? We live in perilous times. Ever since then, we've been at war with uh, radical Islam. And then Pearl Harbor. Is it, being an old guy, I remember December the 7th as clear as crystal, where I was, what happened, etc., when our nation went to war. Clicker or more, maybe? There was a headline last week in the newspaper, and it said, Iran nuclear deal. The good, the bad, and the complicated. And uh, all three of those terms are correct. Uh, it's good that we have people who are strategizing as to how to deal with the situation we're in today. It's bad in that the situation is very serious. But they also had it right when they said it was complicated. It's a very complicated situation we have, and schools have a role to play in it. Now, Assad of Syria praised the Iran nuclear deal as a great victory. Notice how the sides are divided up severely. This is a David Goliath. This is a World War I, World War II situation. The Prime Minister of Israel, Netanyahu, calls the Iran deal a stunning historic mistake. And others who focus on the Middle East, Israeli leaders condemn the deal as one of the darkest days in world history. So we are really in perilous times. If the world is becoming a more dangerous place, year by year, month by month, day by day, then we need to know what is the destiny of this world in which we are now living. And what is the role of schools in this development, past, present, and future? Think back for a moment about the schools you have attended. It probably blink, brings back that flood of memories, good memories and bad memories. The school experience, I believe, makes a major impression on a student. School and the years of attending school are and can be a major, major influence on a student's future work and ministry. One way of looking at schools is as a rite of passage that we all experience together to prepare for the realities of life. Can you, can you, do you have any memories right now of kindergarten? <laughs> I remember in kindergarten opening the door crack and seeing these huge kids marching down the hallway in step, in line, teachers monitoring, and I thought to myself, those second graders, they're so big. Yeah, lots of good times. Now, I hesitated about this slide, but here's what I've decided. Since we're talking about schools, and schools really have been a big part of my life, I wanted to go over just briefly some of the schools, all of them, that I've been to. I was born in Washington, D.C., and in high school decided I like to be a teacher. So when I graduated, I went to Wilson Teachers College in Washington, D.C. Today, it's District of Columbia University. <clears throat> that was a period of time, those last months of high school and first months of college, when I was coming to know the Lord. It was during that period. So I began uh, attending the evening school of uh, Washington Bible Institute, a very fine evening school. But while there... I began to feel a call to the ministry. 
So I transferred from Wilson Teachers College to Washington Bible Institute, a full-time school, a really good school, lots of good memories uh, from that. Well, at the Bible Institute, I realized that I had been attending two churches for 18 years or 17 years. Never once in that time uh, did I hear from the pulpit or from Sunday school because my mother took uh, myself and my younger brother to church and Sunday school religiously all those years. Never once did I hear, you need to be saved, Bryce. So at Bible Institute, I said, that's not right. And, and I decided to transfer to a separate school, a separate school like uh, the GARB, General Association of Regular Baptists. So I transferred up to um, Baptist Bible Seminary in New York. That was a good experience. When graduation time came, I registered to go out to Wheaton College in their graduate school. Wheaton is a premier college, uh, a great college, especially in its earlier years. But the dean of Baptist Bible Seminary came to me one day and said, Rice, don't go out there. We'd like to have you... Uh, it, uh, <laughs> Sometimes I get emotional, I warn you. <laughs> but he said, uh, Rice, you should participate in the cause. And I knew what he meant by that. He meant that back in that day, at that time, even as today, <clears throat> there was a, a great cause. The church is fractured, divided, and uh, there are a lot of difficulties. And he was thinking of two main issues. He was thinking of, of the issue between liberalism, modernism, and uh, evangelicalism, and he was also thinking of dispensationalism. And he knew that if I went out to the grad school at Wheaton, I might get diverted from those areas of truth. So I took his advice. I went down to Dallas. Four years. Graduated. A very good experience. But then I said, Rice, this is a good school. You'll never have a better opportunity. If you want to be a teacher, you better think about getting a doctorate. In those days, there were two main things. If you wanted to teach, you needed a doctorate. And if you wanted to survive economically, you needed to write books. So they, they'd constantly say, publish or perish. Yeah, I keep going, leaving this slide too quick here. Well... So I decided I'd stay on at the seminary, and I, and I stayed in the graduate program working on a doctorate. Now, it used to be that people take the doctorate in about three years. And sometimes, in hard times, you can have an accelerated program and finish in two years. And who knows, if you really knew the facts, there might be some people who finished in one year. But, you know, I'm a slow, uh, plodding learner. So it took me, it took me uh, five years, five years working on that doctor. They were great, great times. I look back on them with wonderment. And then it was graduation time. And two weeks before graduation, two weeks after five and four, nine years, faculty members said, Rice, uh, committee has decided we're not going to grant you a doctorate. But we're going to give you a chance. We're going to give you an opportunity. You stay here for another year and work on your, work on your doctorate. We got a, I mean, on your, uh, what do you call it? Dissertation. We got a complaint from one of your dissertation readers about your dissertation. I said, okay. So I spent another year. I, I rewrote portions of the dissertation. It was, let me tell you, up front. It was a good dissertation. And I completed every requirement and much more at that school. So there's a secret behind why I didn't graduate. I have no idea what it is. Uh, 
I went to Dr. Ryrie. He didn't know. He was dean of graduate studies. He didn't know. He says, Rice, I was stunned to hear this. I didn't want to hear that. I wanted to hear him say, Rice, I'll look into this today. We'll get it settled by this afternoon. That's what I wanted to hear. So after one year, we had a dissertation defense schedule. And it was a faculty group. And I went there with my dissertation under my arm. And my two faculty advisors weren't there. The guy that objected to my dissertation, he wasn't there. And my advisor in the doctoral program wasn't there. They said, no, Rice, we've decided that you're not going to graduate. Ten years, no graduation. Now, can schools be good, bad, ugly? Yes, they can. Now, did the good outweigh the bad at every one of these schools? Absolutely. All good schools. Were the faculty members good or bad? Ah, that's, that's, an, interesting, that's an interesting subject. There's a mixture of things. Mixture is a key word. In fact, out at the Fuller Seminary, excuse me, out at Fuller Seminary, there was a professor. I didn't mean to say this, but it comes up. It's kind of a, appropriate. He was a professor of uh, philosophy and Bible and theology. <clears throat> Somebody might remember his name. He was stressed out pulled one way and another way, pulled toward evangelicals, pulled toward Roman Catholicism a little bit, pulled toward liberalism a little bit. But he was a great teacher, and he would ask all of his classes, I want you for the next class, my assignment to you is, I want you to give me one word that you think best explains all of life, one word. Well, he did that every year because it was a favorite topic of his. And he eventually said, the one word, is mixture, and uh, I think he's right about that. It's uh, it, it, it is a key word, mixture, mixture of good and evil. Stress got the best of this professor, and at a conference like this one, when he was scheduled to speak, he committed suicide. Anybody remember his name? Uh, you guys are not old like me. Okay, well, the Lord boosts us up when we need it, and boy, I needed it. So I interviewed for a job, interviewed for a job at the American Institute of Holy Land Studies in Israel. Uh, I had already interviewed a year before and got the job. And uh, the job had one requirement in addition to others, one major one. You had to have a doctorate. So a few weeks before I was to leave for my new job, I, I was told you're not going to get a doctorate. But the founder of that school, G. Douglas Young, great man, he said, Rice, you come anyhow. So went to the Institute and took their two-year program in archaeology. I also performed my job as uh, chaplain of the Institute. While we were there, a few of us decided, look, we're all the way here in Israel. Let's take a course at Hebrew University. And it just so happened that Professor Yadin was offering a course. Have you heard of Yadin, Yigael Yadin? Yeah, most of you have. Well, he's, he's, he's Israel's national hero. He's a military hero. He's an archaeological superstar. He's a, he's a political leader. Uh, he's just a great guy. Much achievements. He, he excavated Masada and Hatzor. So we said, we'll sign up for his course. Now, it was a good group of guys, five of us. I remember Arnie Fruchtenbaum. Do you know that name? Arnold Fruchtenbaum. Uh, Rasmussen, the editor of the Zondervan Biblical Atlas. A really fine young guy who was tough as nails, and he was planning to be a missionary. So we were a good group, and we went to the first class at Hebrew University. And there was Yadin, and he gave this lecture. It was all in Hebrew. Now, you know, when you go to Israel, they put you in an ulpan. They're going to teach you Hebrew in a, in a few weeks. Now, uh, Ernie, uh, er 
what's his name? Arnold, Arnold Fruchtenbaum. He's Jewish. He's a Jewish kid. He knew Hebrew. So they said, sign up here, there, or there. Sign up here if you don't know any Hebrew. Sign up here if you've had some Hebrew in school. And I don't know what the was. And dumb me, I sign up. Well, I've been to seminary. I know a little Hebrew. Arnold, who speaks Hebrew, he goes to the very elementary one. So after it was all over, Arnold had increased his, um, what was the word, sufficiency, efficiency, uh, whatever, really well. And, and I was still struggling with Hebrew, as most seminary students do all their lives. Is that right? Yeah, it is right. <clears throat> oh, uh, the reason I wanted to tell you about Yadin, one of the problems with schools is the professors are sometimes at odds with each other. You can be have a lot of animosity for a fellow teacher. So we went up to Yadin after class, first class. And one of the other guys was spokesman. I just stood there with my mouth open. And uh, he, as the student said to Yadin, can you have any suggestion uh, about uh, how we can get through your course? You're speaking in Hebrew, and we're just new at it. And one of the students mentioned that we were at the American Institutes whose chief teacher, instructor, was a man called Anson Rainey. How many have heard Anson Rainey? Anson Rainey is a incredible, oh, yeah, hey, Jeff, I can't even see that, so it'll have to be, oh, uh, oh, my goodness. That's bad news. So, I'm going to save that story for a little bit later and move on. Uh, I'm amazed at how my own life, I'm 84, has been wrapped up in schools. I didn't realize it until I started thinking about this presentation. These are a few of the schools that I've, I've been a faculty member at. Southern Bible Training School in Dallas, a mostly African-American school, uh, the Evening School of Washington Bible College, Suburban Bible Institute in Willow Grove, Pennsylvania, Faith Community Bible Institute, and Faith Theological Seminary. My main effort there was at that last school, Faith Theological Seminary. I think I'll go back and just give you the punchline on the Yadin uh, Anson Rainey story. When Anson Rainey's name was mentioned, I saw the face of Professor Yadin slowly turn red. And his countenance changed from friendly to I was afraid. And then he said, I'd like you five students to march yourselves over to the registrar's office and get out of my class. No student who is a student of Anson Rainey can be in any of my classes. And he turned away. Wow, this is the animosity thing. Now, in 15, uh, in 12 or 13 minutes, we're not going to finish here, so I'm just going to say this as a bottom line. Schools have tremendous potential, but they're in, a, they're in a great deal of trouble, I think. Schools are in trouble. It's because the potential is so great and the need is so great. Now I'm going to move a little, fast, a little fast. We need to be, we want and need from schools to be real. Uh, realities of life can be wonderful and they can be harsh. Facing reality can be a real test. By the way, I do have a handout that has the things that I'm not going to have time to, to tell you. And, and uh, so I just, I'm glad I put that together. Uh, but we need reality and truth from the schools. I've always been impressed with this statement by William Shakespeare. All the world is a stage like this. And all the men and women are merely players on the stage. They have their exits and they have their entrances. That really is a wonderful summary of life. And, and it's always been impressed. Another thing that, it, <clears throat> yes, we have our roles to play. Uh, here's the question though. Are we limited to a pre-written script or do we make real decisions and choices in life? Calvinism says you go by a, a written script for you. What you say, what you do, it's all written down ahead of time and you can't, veer from it. But a biblical viewpoint 
which I call biblical dispensationalism. It says, no, this is the real thing. And also, I'm very impressed with the concept of the unfolding drama of redemption. This is the title of a very famous book that a man spent his whole life writing. And it's a wonderful phrase. Unfolding refers to biblical dispensationalism in the sense that God's program unfolds. Scene by scene, intermission, scene by scene, prelude, uh, epi epi what's, the, what's the word? Epilogue or whatever. Anyhow, what is the gold standard? This is important, even if we only get, this is only point one. What is the gold standard in essential matters of reality and truth? If schools are going to be reach their potential, what's the standard by which they operate? The gold standard is freedom. Freedom of religion and freedom of conscience. These things we take for granted. But humankind didn't come to this until centuries and millenniums. This was not even true in Calvin's time. America led the way for freedom of religion and freedom of conscience, not an easy way because the pilgrims and the Puritans, they, they didn't have freedom for, of religion for anybody but themselves. A Quaker could be hung. A Baptist could be banished. So anyhow, through Roger Williams and our founding fathers, they hammered out freedom of religion, freedom of conscience, separation of church and state. Uh, so, freedom to think, freedom to feel, freedom to act. Mind, heart, and will. These are the things we have to work with. This is what the school deals with. I was reading this uh, book here on the plane coming down, and uh, I, I, it interests me because he said head and heart. Now, Gary Will is a conservative, mostly politician, I think, but he, he treats in this book all the things that you and I are most interested in. He treats religion in America from the early settlers to the present day. Now, I, I want to make a point here. Books are good, but the academy is bad. Now, the academy first referred to Calvin's school. It was called the Academy. But Calvin died, and uh, his, his successor, Biza, uh, he took it on, and that school lasted for about 40 years. And then it kind of changed into a, a univer big university medical school and stuff like that. But in those 40 years, these two men, they indoctrinated and propagandized a whole generation of British, English, Scottish, European, German pastors and teachers and leaders. And at this school, there was one textbook, The Institutes of the Christian Religion. The same year that the school opened, Calvin finished the final edition of his great, what he called magnum opus, his great work. This book on essentially one word. What's that one word? Predestination. Now, if you get a group of people, year after year after year, and you have one textbook, I mean, there might have been others, but this was the textbook. And remember, since he was about 23, 24 years old when he wrote it, his first edition was a small little book, but he revised it and worked on it all his life. So he wrote it in his early 20s, but, and he rewrote it and rewrote it and rewrote it, until his mid-50s, and, and he, he had it honed. It was a perfect, a perfect vehicle to propagandize people. And all of Europe's top leaders were propagandized, I'm talking about in religion, uh, at, at the academy. And they came away Calvinists. And Calvinism, which was established then and there, from in those years, it's still the major, the major uh, theological viewpoint worldwide today. Now, since, Jeff, we only have about, what, five, ten minutes? I'm going to skip the whole, I don't know why a person would do this, to put together a presentation and then make it too long and then have to come to the end like this.
But I'm going to make my conclusions, and, 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 and I'm not going to give you the, uh, much of the material that it's based on, except they are in the handout. The Academy was founded for the purpose of inculcating Calvinism, predestination. Dallas Seminary, 1924, was founded by men who had an understanding of dispensationalism. Dispensationalism is simply the key to interpreting the Bible accurately and correctly. But all those early faculty members were Calvinists. Now, Calvinism and biblical dispensationalism are diametrically opposed. They don't fit together. So, I think the Academy overwhelmed DTS. You know, I had heard before I went to Dallas, oh man, all they think about down there is dispensationalism. Oh, okay. So I go down there and I don't find anybody talking about dispensationalism. There was a professor who had promised an important article on dispensationalism in Bibsac uh, a few months before. So I went to him and I said, hey, I don't see your article. No, nah, I'm not going to write it. Now, I went out on a limb like I do lots of times. I said, well, why, why wouldn't you write that? I'm looking forward to it. I just didn't feel like writing it. Now, my impression in my years, many of them at Dallas, there wasn't a whole lot of interest in dispensationalism. Now, there's, there's something called traditional normative dispensationalism, and I think Dr. Ryrie is the perfect exemplification of that, and that is really a good position. But it's not perfect. It's not perfect. And I think there is a call for groups like this one and individuals like you to keep refining dispensationalism until we get it completely right. And, and, a, and, and you wouldn't be both a Calvinist and a dispensationalist if you get it completely right. Okay, now. <laughs> Gave him my conclusion. I'll go back and stop the week. Oh, I want to talk about the... Uh, how many minutes, Jeff? Oh, good. So, first I want, I want to tell you about the oldest school in the world that's been operating continuously from the beginning until now degree granting, and it's located, what continent do you think it's in? Africa. It's in um, Morocco, the oldest school. It was founded as a mosque. It developed into uh, a prestigious university. Second oldest school in the whole world. What continent? Africa. What, city, what uh, country? Egypt, right, Egypt. Uh, I don't have it right in front of me here, but al Aksar, something like that, started as a mosque, became a prestigious university. The reason I wanted to mention that one, the second one, is that when our president, President Obama, took office, within a few weeks, he had planned on a, a message to the Muslim world. And he wanted to select a very strategic place to give this message. What place do you think he might have selected? This second oldest university in the world. Why? Because it's the most prestigious university in the eyes of Muslims world over. Okay. We've had schools down the line. I'm, I, I think that what I'm saying is applying this to today. A religious school needs to communicate to its students that there's a huge difference between man's word and God's word. That's the key. Now, I've always been kind of a history buff. If I thought, if I could think of the biggest mistake that the human race has ever made from the beginning, from Adam until now, I would think it is. The human race has substituted their own wisdom and their own knowledge and their own word for God's word. Now, it's ironic that at Princeton Theological Seminary, you had some of the men who did the best work in defending inspiration, inerrancy, etc. They did the good work, but they're the very ones 
who went against all that they said they stood for and substituted Calvinism for that inspired, inerrant word. And then one day, the whole group of them were fired. Why? Because the board at Princeton, younger men from the liberal seminaries, had decided they needed a fresh, more modern, more postmodern, more whatever. And those men were fired. I mean, the guys that wrote those books, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So what did they do? Well, they went to Philadelphia, and they founded Westminster Theological Seminary. And they were looking for a scapegoat. Look what's happened to us, our reputation, everything. Who's to who's at fault that we're kicked out of Princeton and now we're down here in this fledgling new school? You know who it is? You know who's at fault? It's that guy, Lewis Ferry Chafer. He's at fault. And those dispensationalists, they're bad. And uh, in, in the presentation here, I have the book that's written about that whole story by uh, Magnum, a uh, professor up there in Philadelphia. And he tells a story of the big conflict between the Calvinists and the dispensations. I want to end with an illustration. Oh, two illustrations. Uh, one, I have a, a video that I brought with me, DVD, called Expelled. Ex what's the word? Ex Expelled, I guess. Uh, if you haven't seen it, you need to see it, and I've got it here. You come to me afterwards, and I'll lend it to you while you're here in the conference. Watch it. But it tells the story of what has happened to American higher education. It's been hijacked. It's been hijacked. And uh, <clears throat> it's a wonderful story, and it's so well done. It's uh, moving. It's, it's just beautiful, but it shows how higher education has become a one-way street. Uh, for example, it's... The theme of it is that across the country, any professor that mentions the term divine design will lose their job. And it happened uh, uh, close by. Now, what's, what's the comedian's name that I'm trying to think of? Ben Stein. Ben Stein. Well, Ben Stein heard the story that right down in Washington, D.C., there at the big Smithsonian Institute, a professional editor, real strong guy, who edits material that comes in, had passed on to peer review an article in which just the mention of divine design was in there. And that guy was called on the carpet. He's a professional guy. He's not a creationist or anything. And he lost his job. So it hit the newspapers, uh, <clears throat> and there was a congressional investigation. And they decided, yeah, that was what they did. They, that was a denial of uh, academic freedom. And Ben Stein said, I'm going to see if this is elsewhere, because people were saying that that doesn't happen across the country. He goes across the country and interviews people, all of whom have lost their jobs for that same thing. So that's a good video. It's really good to see. The other illustration is this. There's a man called uh, Wayne Root, and he's mostly a, an economist. <clears throat> and this is an illustration to show how that higher education has been hijacked in America. So it's a complicated story. But he was a student at Columbia University back in, I think, 1981. And uh, the school is filled. Oh, that's, that's good. Thanks. This is the guy. Uh, he's written two good books. That's one. And he's written another one. And he's in this beautiful classroom, stadium style, with the slanted seats, screens, everything. And it's a political science class, because he's a political science major. And uh, uh, all of a sudden, the door burst open, and a student screaming came through the door and said, the president has been assassinated. At that time, uh, Reagan was president. So Root said, uh, I'm a big fan of Reagan. Tears rolled down my eye, uh, rolled down my face. But he said, what surprised me was what happened in the class. Huge class, 120 students. They all rose up 
from their chairs and cheered. This is this is uh, American University. No, what is that right? American University. There are, see, it's good to keep your slides. They, they keep you accurate on the details. But just think uh, that our, this is not all schools. None of the schools I went to would have students like that. But this are elitist schools across the country, including schools like Occidental University. This is the last last point. I'll finish with this and have a question or two if we have, if Jeff will allow it. Uh, and, uh, okay, slipped my mind. So, any any quick questions that you might have about this disjointed presentation? I'm really apologetic. Any questions? Any? Yes, sir. Mark was the first synoptic gospel, according to that theory. Yeah. There was a very interesting book and a whole series of articles that came out as a result of one dissertation that was written called William Farmer and the Control of Knowledge. What it turns out is that as the German, uh, various German uh, groups were trying to uh, formed together into a nation. Uh, they created the first university system that was a meritocracy, where they were not concerned about were your parents wealthy or were you of nobility or so on and so forth. So the objective was students would compete in order to show that they were qualified to enter uh, the German universities. The idea of the German university was that it would ultimately set a groundwork under which a nation could be created. They wanted top engineers. They wanted things like uh, this because they ultimately saw that they were going to have to build a war machine. There was a very interesting little uh, detail that showed up and uh, has been pursued. And this is that uh, they would ask a, a potential professor, no matter what he was aiming at for his area of expertise, to be either a physics professor or a math professor or whatever, they would ask him, which gospel was written first? And if he said Matthew, then they said, this man is loyal to the Pope. He should not be on the faculty. Yeah. But the uh, the academy was arguing that Mark was written first, and if a person said Mark was written first, then they were considered for a faculty position. Wow. And there, there's a whole body of literature on yeah. that. Yeah, thank you for that. Anybody else? Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.